Are you ready to shatter some of your beliefs about digital audio? Because I'm about to show you a video that reveals the truth about the digital stair step myth and proves that 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz audio playback is just as good as high-res formats, if not better. I know this goes against what many experts out there are saying, but you're about to see the evidence to back it up. So sit back, relax, and get ready to read some angry comments below. I was introduced to this video back in college by the instructor of my digital audio course. In the video, Monty Montgomery sets up a fully analog system, including an analog signal generator, an analog oscilloscope, and an analog spectrum analyzer. Then he drops a digital audio interface in the middle to convert the signal from analog to digital and then back to analog. If the stair step myth about digital audio were true, we would see a jagged waveform when the signal is played back from the audio interface and through the analog oscilloscope. That's what I expected to see the first time I watched this video. I thought that a higher sample rate would result in a more accurate representation of the signal. It does make intuitive sense if you think about it. Wouldn't a higher sample rate mean that you could capture the spaces between the samples with more resolution? Well, let's see. Okay, it's go time. We begin by converting an analog signal to digital, and then right back to analog again with no other steps. The signal generator is set to produce a 1 kHz sine wave, just like before. We can see our analog sine wave on our input side oscilloscope. We digitize our signal to 16-bit PCM at 44.1 kHz, same as on a CD. The spectrum of the digitized signal matches what we saw earlier and what we see now on the analog spectrum analyzer aside from its high impedance input being just a smidge noisier. For now, the waveform display shows our digitized sine wave as a stair-step pattern, one step for each sample, and when we look at the output signal that's been converted from digital back to analog, we see it's exactly like the original sine wave. No stair-steps. Okay, 1 kilohertz is still a fairly low frequency. Maybe the stair-steps are just hard to see, or they're being smoothed away. Fair enough. Let's choose a higher frequency, something close to Nyquist, say 15 kilohertz. Now the sine wave is represented by less than three samples per cycle, and the digital waveform looks pretty awful. Well, looks can be deceiving. The analog output is still a perfect sine wave, exactly like the original. Let's keep going up. 16 kilohertz, 17 kilohertz, 18 kilohertz, 19 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz. Welcome to the upper limits of human hearing. The output waveform is still perfect. No jagged edges, no drop-off, no stair steps. Let me clarify some things Monty mentioned in this first clip. He started with a 1 kilohertz sine wave, but human hearing ranges from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So he increased the frequency until it reached 20 kilohertz, the highest frequency we can hear. You may have heard Monty say, a frequency closer to Nyquist. In digital audio, the Nyquist frequency is the highest frequency that can be accurately sampled and recreated by the system. The Nyquist frequency is determined by the sample rate that's being used. A digital audio system can capture and reproduce a signal perfectly and completely, as long as the highest frequency content of the signal is less than half the sample rate. So, if we wish to reproduce the full range of human hearing from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, we need to use a sample rate that's at least 40 kilohertz. In this example, the system he was using had a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is the standard for CD quality audio. The signal was still perfectly recreated on the analog oscilloscope. If the stair step myth were true, that wave would have looked something like this. So where were the stair steps? Well, let's keep watching. So, where'd the stair steps go? Don't answer, it's a trick question. They were never there. Drawing a digital waveform as a stair step was wrong to begin with. Why? A stair step is a continuous time function. It's jagged and it's piecewise, but it has a defined value at every point in time. 
a sampled signal is entirely different. It's discrete time. It's only got a value right at each instantaneous sample point, and it's undefined. There is no value at all everywhere in between. A discrete time signal is properly drawn as a lollipop graph. The continuous analog counterpart of a digital signal passes smoothly through each sample point, and that's just as true for high frequencies as it is for low. Now the interesting, and not at all obvious bit is, there's only one band-limited signal that passes exactly through each sample point. It's a unique solution, so if you sample a band-limited signal and then convert it back, the original input is also the only possible output. And before you say, oh, I can draw a different signal that passes through those points, well, yes, you can, but... <clears throat> If it differs even minutely from the original, it contains frequency content at or beyond Nyquist, breaks the band limiting requirement, and isn't a valid solution. So how did everyone get confused and start thinking of digital signals as stair steps? I can think of two good reasons. First, it's easy enough to convert a sampled signal to a true stair step. Just extend each sample value forward until the next sample period. This is called a zero order hold. And it's an important part of how some digital-to-analog converters work, especially the simplest ones. So, anyone who looks up digital-to-analog converter or digital-to-analog conversion is probably going to see a diagram of a stair-step waveform somewhere. But that's not a finished conversion, and it's not the signal that comes out. Second, and this is probably the more likely reason, engineers who supposedly know better, like me, draw stair-steps, even though they're technically wrong. It's sort of like a one-dimensional version of fat bits in an image editor. Pixels aren't squares, either. They're samples of a two-dimensional function space, and so they're also, conceptually, infinitely small points. Practically, it's a real pain in the ass to see or manipulate infinitely small anything. So big squares it is. Digital stair-step drawings are exactly the same thing. It's just a convenient drawing. The stair-steps aren't really there. Another component of the stair-step myth has to do with bit depth. Bit depth describes how many digital bits are contained within each sample. Each bit can represent two values, on or off, so each time you add a bit, you double the possible values that can be represented by that sample. Again, intuition might suggest that more bit depth makes for a smoother representation of the amplitude of the signal leading to a more accurate representation of the original waveform. But as I learned from Monty's video, this isn't actually the benefit of increasing bit depth. When we convert a digital signal back to analog, the result is also smooth regardless of the bit depth. 24 bits or 16 bits or 8 bits, it doesn't matter. So does that mean that the digital bit depth makes no difference at all? Of course not. Channel 2 here is the same sine wave input but we quantize, with dither, down to 8 bits. On the scope, we still see a nice, smooth sine wave on channel 2. Look very close, and you'll also see a bit more noise. That's a clue. If we look at the spectrum of the signal... Aha! Our sine wave is still there unaffected, but the noise level of the 8-bit signal on the second channel is much higher. And that's the difference the number of bits makes. That's it. When we digitize a signal, first we sample it. The sampling step is perfect, it loses nothing. But then we quantize it, and quantization adds noise. The number of bits determines how much noise, and so the level of the noise floor. What does this dithered quantization noise sound like? Let's listen to our 8-bit sine wave. That may have been hard to hear anything but the tone. Let's listen to just the noise after we notch out the sine wave and then bring the gain up a bit because the noise is quiet. Those of you who have used analog recording equipment may have just thought to yourselves, my goodness, that sounds like tape hiss. Well, it doesn't just sound like tape hiss, it acts like it too. And if we use a Gaussian dither, then it's mathematically equivalent in every way. 
it is tape hiss. Intuitively, that means that we can measure tape hiss, and thus the noise floor of magnetic audio tape, in bits, instead of decibels, in order to put things in a digital perspective. Compact cassettes. For those of you who are old enough to remember them, could reach as deep as 9 bits in perfect conditions. Though 5 to 6 bits was more typical, especially if it was a recording made on a tape deck. That's right, your mixtapes were only about 6 bits deep, if you were lucky. The very best professional open reel tape used in studios could barely hit. Any guesses? 13 bits with advanced noise reduction, and that's why seeing DDD on a compact disc used to be such a big high-end deal. So the advantage of increased bit depth is a lower noise floor, and therefore an increased dynamic range. But even 16-bit digital audio files have more than enough dynamic range to account for the full dynamic range of human hearing, especially when you consider the environmental noise that's all around us. A 16-bit digital audio file has a theoretical dynamic range of 96 decibels. First of all, 96 dB SPL is deafeningly loud. If you consider 0 dB SPL to be the quietest sound we can hear, you would need to be listening at an extremely high level to require the full dynamic range of even 16-bit audio. Although, in theory, the full dynamic range of human hearing between the quietest sound we can hear and the point where it's so loud it's painful is between 130 and 140 dB. Still, at any reasonable listening level, 96 dB is more than enough when you consider the noise within even the most exceptionally quiet listening environment, let's say with a noise floor of 20 dB SPL. If you still don't believe that 16-bit audio has more dynamic range than we'll ever need, consider that this 96 dB figure is actually quite misleading. It refers to the RMS noise level of the entire broadband signal, not just a narrow band. In fact, the effective dynamic range of 16-bit audio with proper dithering reaches 120 dB. This next quote from a ziff.org article is so mind-blowing that it made me literally laugh out loud when I read it, so get ready. 120 dB is greater than the difference between a mosquito somewhere in the room and a jackhammer a foot away. Think about that for a second. All this to say 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz audio is more than enough for playback even on the very best hi-fi systems. In fact, attempting to play back ultrasonic content by playing a 192 kilohertz file not only takes up four times the hard drive space without any audible benefit, but it might actually cause audible distortions that lead to decreased fidelity. I'll leave some resources below so you can do some research on your own. But there are very good reasons why we use 24-bit audio with high sample rates in music production which is what I'll talk about in a future video. So make sure to subscribe to Audio University so you won't miss it when it comes out.